This is Robert Clinkybeard and David Anderson with the Commercial Landscapers Podcast. We're going to take 20 minutes of your life to deliver some amazing business content from accomplished leaders to bring you value, skill your business, and bid yourself personally. We hope you really enjoy the show and I encourage you to share with your network so they can subscribe and we can expand these messages globally. We are also super excited to be supported by two brilliant sponsors. If you're tired of measuring properties, site, recon, platform, fully automated measurements, you can focus on sales. So think measurements, think site recon. The other sponsor is Company Cam, who make it dead simple to communicate, document, and problem solve with guys in the field, no matter where you are. Company Cam brings documentation, communication, and liability protection together in one simple, easy to use app for you and your entire team. Company Cam is the only app every landscaper needs. Check it out. Hi, this is Robert Clinkenbeard and David Anson with the Commercial Landscapers podcast. Super excited today to be joined by Mike Rory. Mike, thank you for joining me today. Happy to be here with you, Robert. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. So, Mike, uh, I've you know we had a good discussion before, but for our listeners who don't know who you are, just uh, Maybe just give us a quick background of uh, you and your contribution to the green industry. Thank you. Yes, I've spent my my lifetime in the industry. 1979, I began as a one-man show uh, doing residential work. I graduated quickly within the first three years to 100% commercial. So I spent my uh, first 30 years building Groundmasters, ended up selling it to Brickman, uh, late 06, hung out there for about three years and watched a $500 million company operate, which was very educational and uh, exciting for me. Uh, left there in about 2010, uh, bought uh, GIS Dynamics in 2010 11 and realized it would revolutionize uh, field takeoffs with uh, the internet and uh, aerial map measuring and have had that product for the last 10 years, goilon.com. Uh, you can find us, um, check out our new instant estimator. And then in 2014, went back into the commercial ground space with my oldest daughter, Rachel, who was a part of Ground Masters back in the day and uh, several of our previous managers. And they've scaled that business back up nicely to where we were in the commercial ground space in Cincinnati, Dayton, Northern Kentucky currently. Uh, and then I've always uh, tried to contribute and give back to the green industry. So I'm thrilled to be here with, with Robert, uh, hopefully sharing a message with everybody that's joined us today. Cool. Well, thank you, Mike. That's a tremendous uh, history there. Um, so, you know, jumping into one of the things that we talked about offline you know, a lot of companies will get into the landscape industry and it's, you know, it's a fairly low barrier to entry, but, you know, they try and grab as much revenue at the beginning just to sort of try and get some money in the door. But then, then they start to realize, well, you know, I'm spread too thin. They start to think about what am I going to focus on? What, what are the market segments I should be really, you know, jumping into? So talk to me a little bit about that, you know, um, for these news of up and coming companies. Thank you. Yes, uh, Robert, you know, <clears throat> when I do my trailblazers where I'm consulting, giving back to the industry uh, with, with all size companies, uh, you know, a million dollars to uh, tens of millions. What I like to look at initially is, well, well show, me, show me your profit center. Show me what the business does. And what you quickly learn is a, how broad the industry is with so many segments. The biggest deviation, in my opinion, is residential and commercial. So business to consumer and B2B, business to business. To me, that's the biggest deviation because to run both of those are two different models. Working at someone's home, working for someone who's working for someone in a business are two completely different worlds. and. Then you go into the second uh, group of segments, and that would be, you know, design, bid, build, build, bid, build, uh, hardscape, irrigation, maintenance, snow, 
uh, you know, putting in pools, uh, walls, uh, it's, it's endless. So what you really learn if you go look at any industry and in anyone's business that has succeeded is they have defined who they are, uh, what that uh, company does, and they stay disciplined and stick to the, the, these segments that they're going to really try to perfect. The broader you get it, uh, the, the more complicated it is to build, operate, and win at. So, no, that's so true. Yeah, I, and I agree. But what, you know, do you do you ever um, steer them in a certain direction? You know, especially when you start thinking about, you know, yes, they might be making a lot of money right now, but you know, at some point, there's going to be some type of an exit. Uh, either under their control or out with their control, but do you ever steer them in a certain direction based on the final outcome, whether it be a sale uh, to you know an external party or, or internal employees? But what, what would your advice be there? Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, the other thing about running a complicated business is the enterprise value is how I refer to that. Robert, uh, is, is far lower. Um, the more complicated the business is, A, I'm going to say it's going to be harder to make money in general. B, you're going to be more subject to a lot of the ups and downs of other things like the overall economy and other variables within all those market segments. They're not all going to hit at the same time forever. And therefore, when you do want to ultimately sell the business beyond asset value, which would be what the brick and mortar and the, and the equipment are worth with a little bit of blue sky for the business, you're in a far less advantageous position than if you would have spent uh, out of your 30 or 40 years, which is what most of us are going to spend, especially with how much longer we all live. Uh, you're going to sell that thing for way less. Uh, when you look at any scaled operation, I don't care what it is, you're going to see that they're not doing uh, 15 different profit centers. They're doing three or four mega profit centers with two or three offshoots that have something to do with the mega profit centers, in my opinion in terms of enhancing, supporting, feeding those megas. Uh, and your enterprise value is going to be so far less valuable because people do not want to pay for variability. They pay for reliability. They pay for consistency. I spoke to a guy the other day on that subject, and they want 75% reoccurring or 75% stable year over year. And, and 20 to 25 or less percent variable in anything they acquire. Why? Because they're betting their money and they want to know what they can expect within a tight tolerance. So, you know, the, the, other, the other thing that I see all the time, Robert, is everybody keeps picking profit centers, if you are going to be a little more diverse, that are all running in the same months at full capacity as the others. So I say to people all the time in this business, I go look at December, January, February, which is typically the, the weakest quarter other than the guys that are really committed to snow and in the snow belt will say they lose a lot of money. So if you're gonna be diverse in your profit centers, in your market segments, show me something that's gonna run when your other profit centers either aren't able to run or are barely running and, and build into those months, that, that quarter or trimester where you need a profit center. Uh, I don't care what it is. Uh, hell, I'd tell you to go clean warehouses or, or <laughs> work for a painting contractor. I mean, do any daggone thing. I mean, have a Christmas tree farm. Um, you know, the snow is the easiest if it exists. And what you're trying to achieve there, I would tell you, would simply be building the snow business big enough to break even minimum 
in those three or four months. So if you have a $400,000 overhead structure monthly, you know, 5 million annually, and let's just say we're going to take a quarter, December, January, February, a million two, and hypothetically you can, you can produce a 50% gross margin, uh, then you need to do two and a half million dollars worth of snow work a year. Now, other than the variability of the snow, under your normal averages, that's how big you need to build the business. So that's how much work you need to sell, how much capacity you need to have, the margin you need to hit, to pour over that overhead to where those months are zero. They break even. Why? Because then you're not giving back uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars month over month off of when the business was really clicking and making a lot of money. And I say this to guys all the time. It's like they make a million bucks in eight months and they give half of it back in four months. So they make half a million bucks annualized. Yep. Well, especially when they're trying to retain all that good labor they've, you know, they've brought into the business and, um, you know, it's definitely, definitely challenging during the winter months to keep them busy. So yeah, I agree hundred percent. You know, what, what are the things that you could do over the winter period just to, you know, keep that profitability up? No question. The, the other thing about any segment is <clears throat> you've got to manage a pipeline of leads for every segment you choose in order to not have an air pocket in the segment, meaning no sales coming out of it. So everybody that I see winning, substantially uh, builds that pipeline as big as they can get it, knows how to manage it, knows what the close rates are going to be and are constantly shoveling into it. So it never contracts. It only grows. And that's another thing about every segment you take on is you're going to have to become an expert at managing that pipeline. And, you know, pipelines need to run year round, not, uh, seasonally or infrequently or inconsistently, or they let you down because you haven't managed it well. So just another key aspect. And then of course, competition for every segment you're in, there's another batch of competitors and you could be in their primary space and it's one of your second or third uh, profit centers. Uh, so it can make it difficult to compete, uh, difficult to be paid well in that segment. So all these things go together. So if you wanna be a residential design build contractor, be the best you can be at that. Uh, you, you probably aren't gonna sell a lot of work other than evergreen markets in the off season. And, and I'm gonna say that's the winter season because people just aren't thinking about their backyards. So what are you gonna do with your workforce? What are you gonna do with your business in that segment? And I would challenge you to come up with that, even if it's your workforce going to work for someone else who has an abundance of work at that time for that quarter, other than your core overhead people that you know just need to keep the, the doors open. Uh, but I wouldn't be going into 12 or 13 things chasing revenue, as you stated at the beginning of this, yeah. thinking yeah. that that's the answer. That's the absolute wrong answer. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but, you know, to pick up on a point you mentioned, I think a lot, well, certainly some of the companies I go into and I start asking them about pipeline and that pipeline could be, you know, maintenance contracts, it could be enhancements. And then I start ask, digging, asking them about their close rates and starting to, you know, dig, dig a little bit deeper. I get that blank look in the face and it really... Um, it amazes me that you know people don't have that transparency of where what their pipeline looks like, and a lot of them are still trying to grasp with well, what what social media platforms do I use? How am I funneling those leads coming in? Uh, so I think you know a lot of people would really struggle with that whole sales process, especially now that we're you know we're using social media. It's not just the old traditional ways of relationships. There's so many different avenues out there that um, uh, a lot of people th seem to struggle with. D does that, you, do you see that much? There, there's no doubt. Um, again, 
learning a primary market segment and having your brand be recognized by that segment is the ultimate spot to be in. If, if I say the name of your brand, whether it's Bob's Landscaping or, or Groundmasters or, or Brightview, and the buyers in that segment don't know your brand, don't recognize your brand, you are at a very big disadvantage. So another reason not to be doing uh, 15 or 20% per segment, making up your 100% business of all these segments is nobody knows what you do. Uh, you don't become the brand name or the top one, two, or three brands in the segment uh, where you want the, the buyer to recognize you. So, <clears throat> you know, for commercial, uh, we know that facility managers, purchasing agents, and property managers, and then a very small private segment owner are the buyers. That's where we know to go. That's where we know to get in front of for our business, because that's who we're talking to uh, in order to be invited to the party to begin the process. If we're a consumer-driven product, we're selling to homeowners, then we need to know where they're going. So potentially the markets you're serving, which typically aren't more than a few uh, zip codes for most of these guys that are in that space, it's the grocery stores, it's the churches, it's the country clubs, it's the tennis clubs, and your brand needs to be seen doing and, and where you want to acquire more of that business. And that's where you need to market to. Uh, I tell residential contractors all the time, if, if you want to do more homes in communities, go bid the HOA and do their neighborhood and then solicit to the neighborhood. The board has the ability to send anything out uh, to everyone in their community. And, and it's to me a double whammy. You're taking care of their common area. And now there's 150 homes in that neighborhood that you wanna sell backyard landscapes to or, or new front yards to, or just do their care uh, and, and compound your, your message uh, by compounding your effort in those types of examples. No, that's, that's great advice, uh, Mike. So you know, we're getting close to uh, finishing up here, but what would be the, the one other, I suppose, trend or what, what you've seen over the last, I mean, the last 12 months have been pretty challenging for a lot of companies, um, just in terms of, you know, be, working remotely, dealing with technology changes, uh, trying to get in front of clients. What, what, what's probably the biggest piece of advice for, again, up and coming companies that they need to look carefully at as you look into the future? Well, in general, uh, along the lines we've been discussing, I would be very conservative, you know, in the channel that I'm gonna pick to go do business and make sure that there's an infinite amount of business against my expectation for how much business I wanna do. So if, if you think you wanna be a million dollar contractor, go to your, your local chamber of commerce and know what your point of sale is worth. So let's just say it's $5,000 annualized for, for care on a, on a half to three quarter acre home site and whatever suburb in the US you live in and how many homes are in the geographic area you wanna cover, which you probably wouldn't need a 25 mile radius, uh, but, but go validate that, confirm that. And then, you know, understand who's in that demographic. You know, what age group are you serving? Uh, what are the biggest businesses in that uh, community you know, you could be in a college town, you could be in an industrial town, you could be in a tech town. So, you know, confirm that and or uh, the B2B, the same thing. You know, what is it you really want to go do uh, and, and make sure you know how much of it's there. Uh, and then I would make sure that I got the technology platform that would help me manage the business. 
when I ran Groundmasters from 1980, call it, to uh, 2006, we built our own systems because you did not have the platforms we have today to run the businesses with. Uh, and there's five or six of them I could rattle off uh, today, uh, you know, like Aspire being one of the leaders, but there's four or five good competitors. Uh, so understand that, understand how cheap that is to have a platform to help you manage the business. Because if you aren't managing that business on a tech platform, you're managing it on spreadsheets. Uh, you're managing that in Excel. You're managing that with people's uh, effort. And that is a long road. And, and uh, you know, it took me 10 years to do a million dollars in a year. It took me 20 years to get to 5 million. Once we had technology working for us, we were able to grow three to $4 million a year infinitely called That's the management model. So yep. I would just tell contractors to do their homework and pick wisely before they start just selling and doing stuff. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think it's easier to adopt some software earlier in the process um, rather than trying to introduce it when you're you know, eight or 10 million and then, then it'd just be really tough to try and integrate. So that good segue into Mike, you know, if, if people want to get in touch with you and learn a bit, a little bit more about what you're doing currently, just you know, talk to people about that and how they can contact you and what you're up to these days. Sure. So I spend most of my time uh, on the tech side uh, at GIS Dynamics, the parent company to GoIlon. So GoIlon.com. That brand's been around for over a decade. And the, the revolutionary product that I would encourage contractors to learn about from us is our instant estimator, where we're doing automated estimating for you while we're measuring. I did a talk uh, with Lawn and Landscape yesterday in, in their tech uh, series. Um, it's an incredible product. You select the tool, the machine, the function and begin measuring. And in real time, right before your eyes, you're going to see the estimate appear, time and materials. Uh, whether you're mowing grass, edging and mulching beds, shoveling sidewalks, plowing parking lots, planting flowers, we've given you that absolute uh, proof of how long it's gonna take to produce it and how much material it's gonna take. So goilon.com is where you can find me. Uh, I'm always available by email, M Rory, R O R I E, at gisdynamics.com. And always happy to help any fellow contractor answer any question that they think I could be of value to responding to. So thank you, Robert. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mike. Really appreciate your insights today. I'm sure people will be contacting you directly. And again, this is Robert Clinkenbeard, Dave Anderson with the Commercial Landscapers podcast. And Mike, really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy being here. Thank you. Hopefully that was pure dead brilliant for you today. And we've got some great takeaways for your business and your personal life. This is Robert Clinkenbeard along with David Anderson. And we'd love to get you and your friends to join us on our journey. Two quick things before you go, listeners. Check out our website, thecommerciallandscaper.com. You can subscribe. You can share with your friends. But more importantly, check out our sponsors. We have Site Recon, who are going to help to capture measurements on your property and create a really streamlined process. And we have Company Cam, who make it dead simple to communicate, document, and problem solve with guys in the field, no matter where you are. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.